Good afternoon. Um, it's about time for us to get started. And um, so it's a pleasure for me to welcome you to the second in this series of uh, this semester's ISR IAI Colloquia to be given by our own Professor Arman Mikowski. And the topic is ants, urns, and stochastic approximations. Now, he in general principle, it does not need any introduction, but for the benefit of many students and visitors assembled, I'm going to provide a brief biography of his career. Armand Mikowski came to the United States for graduate study in 1975 after having completed his bachelor's in mathematics at the Free University of Brussels in Belgium. He obtained a master's degree in UCLA in 1976 and completed a doctoral dissertation on dynamic programming for problems of impulsive control under the direction of Professor Ray Rochelle at the University of Kentucky in 1981. Immediately after that, he was invited to join the faculty of the Electrical Engineering Department at the University of Maryland. And that period marked the beginning of what proved to be a period of tremendous growth in the Electrical Engineering Department, in particular in the systems area. He became a full professor of electrical engineering in 1991 and has held a joint appointment with the Institute for Systems Research since 1988. He's also held a number of visiting positions over the years, including at different sites of INRIA, the French National Institute for Computer Science and Automation in France, and Technion, the Israel Institute of Technology, Columbia University, Mittag Leffler Institute of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, and the Ecole Normale Superiore in Paris. He has also held consulting and visiting arrangements in history, including AT&T Bell Labs and IBM. Now, he is a recipient of one of the very first National Science Foundation Presidential Young Investigator Awards, which he enjoyed in the period 84 to 89. Later, he was, for his contributions, elected fellow of the IEEE, and the citations include contributions to traffic modeling and performance evaluation in communication and computer networks. Ever since his arrival in Maryland, Armand has played a central role in education and research in the field of communication systems, he has educated a number of MS and PhD students in diverse subjects, and it's a long list, it includes nonlinear filtering, foundations of queuing networks, stochastic approximations, cellular communication networks, markup decision processes, control policies in data networks, large deviation analysis, random graphs, and more recently, algorithms with roots in the study of swarm behavior. And all of these are, in his work, viewed through the lens of applied probability. His writing in these topics is marked by clarity, completeness and depth, and a fierce commitment to intellectual coherence. And there is a philosophy that guides him, I believe, among other things. And that is that if a problem naturally belongs, this is my phrasing, not his, in a certain ecological niche, then methods used to attack it should also be natural to that niche. A good example of this is one of the earliest problems he tackled in Maryland, filtering under non-Gaussian initial conditions, demonstrating forcefully that a complete solution was available via measured transformation without what one might call extraneous methods. So moving on, while juggling the demands of his research program, he has contributed heavily to the building of institutions on this campus, <coughs> example, the Systems Research Center and the Center for Satellite and Hybrid Communication Networks from their inception the ISR and its con continuing development and transformations, and the highly respected graduate program in communication systems in electrical engineering. As a teacher and a colleague, um, Armand has set and followed exceptionally high standards. While always willing to collaborate, he has encouraged and helped his students to strike out on their own through single author works. Numerous graduate students and colleagues can attest to the benefits accrued from his forthright and incisive criticism of their work. His willingness to provide guidance to newcomers in certain areas has been influential in enhancing the quality and integrity of the environment in ISR. Let us extend a warm welcome to our distinguished colleague and speaker, Armin Lukowski. Thank you for some very, very kind words. I think that today, <clears throat> first I want to thank you for coming. I'd like to uh, perhaps demonstrate how misleading a title it is. 
there are three terms in the title, ENS, ERNS, and Stochastic Approximations. And I'm gonna essentially do the following. I'm gonna tell you a little bit of a story concerning ENS and what they have to do about decentralized control. I'm gonna look at a particular problem which I will claim to have solved. I'll give you the solution. I will explain a little bit on what it's good for. And then I'm going to take you by the hand, so to speak, and I'm going to show you that the solution, in fact, was not exactly known in various literatures. And depending on how you look at this particular problem, this is, in fact, nothing more than an earned model. And if you look at it in a slightly different way, it, this is an example of something known as a stochastic approximation. In both cases, it's a non-classical Earn model, and it's a non-classical stochastic approximation, which means that it's not easy simply to go in the literature, find the theorem, and apply. Okay, so let's start. What's the background? Well, I think many of us uh, are either engaged or dream about large-scale distributed system. We know that decentralized controls is needed in this uh, context, and I think that there is all often a desire to go from a local prescription to a desired or sometimes not so desired global behavior. And I think that there is a certain amount of uh, sex appeal to something known as emergent behavior that comes about from these local interactions that give rise to these large scale or global uh, behavior. And not that we are short of ideas, but looking at the world around us, we find inspiration uh, uh, from a number of paradigms, uh, and we find them in physics, we find them in economics. Uh, for example, why in economics? Because there is apparently the hands of the market that seem to be doing certain things. Uh, people behave individually, but some aggregate behavior seems to emerge, and also in biology especially, right? Now today, I'm going to take the last bullet, biology, and I'm going to focus more specifically on swarm intelligence. And swarm intelligence refers to a class of, uh, let's call them algorithms, a way of looking at problems that are inspired by collectivities uh, such as B, uh, ants, and so forth. And in particular, we're going to try to use this notion as to how ants communicate in the aggregate through their individual actions. We're going to apply this to a very, very simple problem, which I will refer to as the bridge selection problem. Think of it as a toy problem, uh, which uh, embodies the selection of two items. It's a really a toy, very, very simple problem, but you will see it already has some complexity. Uh, you could argue that it has some implementation vaguely in uh, network settings such uh, as routing. And then we will, once we have solved this uh, uh, problem or discussed this problem, we'll m jump to earn models and from there we will hopefully land on the last uh, bullet which will be stochastic approximation. Okay. And please uh, feel free to you know, ask questions, interrupt me. I know that you're not a shy uh, crew so uh, I don't think it's needed, right? So let's start with the ants. I think the story for me started a few years ago when Mark Fleischer over lunch mentioned to me something about swarm intelligence and uh, I have to say I didn't quite understand, I thought it intriguing. But a few days later I managed to put my hands on this book called Swarm Intelligence from Natural to Artificial Systems by Eric Bonabo, Marco Dorigo, and Guy Torella Terolaz. And it's a very, very nicely written book, very crisply uh, written, that presents ideas of how swarm, or what you think swarms do, how these notions, these ideas can be used to implement all kinds of engineering systems. And if you went to chapter two, there was as an opening salvo, there was the recounting of a, an experiment which was implemented, in fact, in my old alma mater in Brussels by Jean-Luc de Nobourg and his team, and it was done in the late 80s. The publication dates 1990. And it was a very simple experimental setup to show how uh, a particular type of uh, ants, the Argentine Ein Lipitema Humile, whatever that may be, 
uh, could in fact uh, self-organize itself as a, as a collectivity to uh, find a food source. Right? And the basic idea was in this experiment, there was one nest, there was one food source, and there were two distinct paths of bridges, as you may call them, and let's assume that they are of equal length. And here, borrowed unashamedly from the paper, is a little picture. Uh, the first part, or the central part, describes the setting, which I've already described in a, in a, a moment ago. And what you have here is some data points that illustrate, essentially, the findings. And for example, what you have is that here is time, and here is the percentage of uh, ants that have actually used the uh, that have used the a particular bridge. Okay, and what you see is that although there are some fluctuations at the beginning, which are due probably to the fact that ants go out and explore, eventually, at least in the first case, they all select one bridge, and in the other case, they select the other bridge. So if we summarize what's here, what we have as a key finding is that eventually one of the branches is used most of the time and it's quite remarkable given the fact that you don't expect the ants to be tweeting, right? You don't expect them to be winking, you don't expect them to be talking to each other. Uh, you, I don't think it would be unfair to them to assume that they have limited communication. And so the idea is that perhaps it would be interesting to figure out how this is happening. And one of the hypotheses that has been put forward is that ants uh, d uh, use or implement such selection through something known as pheromone trails. And what are pheromones? They are chemicals that, that they produce. And when they go somewhere, they lay them in this form of trail, which is then uh, followed by the other ants that uh, follow suit. Okay, so it's a little bit like in this story, I don't remember what it is in, in English, where uh, some little fellow leaves little uh, white stones on his way to wherever, right? Now, this is an example of what's known as stigmergy, from the great stigma and argon sting in work. And it works like this. You have a individual behavior that modifies the environment, but the modified environment, in a sense, signals to individuals what to do next. And for those who are familiar with control theory, this is an example of signaling through actions, and in this case, the actions modify the environment. For example, if you've learned, so studied way, way back some adaptive control, uh, this idea recurs. It's not called stigmergy, but we all know what, what, uh, uh, what it is. Okay? And as part of the uh, paper that I mentioned uh, earlier, there was a simple model that tried to somehow reconstruct this idea that eventually all ants end up going on the same bridge. And so here is the, the setting. I have two bridges. Let's label them A and B. I have an infinite population of ants. Again, let's label them N, 1, 2, up to wherever we're going to go. And let's introduce two quantities which are going to act for proxies for the pheromone laid by the various ant. And so let's call A, N, and B, N the number of ants that have traveled on bridge A and B respectively, and we will assume that there is no evaporation. Right now, clearly this is a very, very simple model. It doesn't quite reflect reality because evaporation is always at work, but we will assume here that we operate at time scale such that evaporation is really not an issue. Okay. So, having said that, Think of constructing the following simulation model. So I have the randomness un, which is a sequence of ID random variables, which are uniformly distributed on the interval 0, 1. And imagine that the ants have, have come up, and they have been sent on their way. And suppose that the n first n have essentially gone where they're supposed to go. Right? So I, the time the n plus first end is supposed to show up, we have available to us a n and b n, which I'll remind you are the respective numbers of ends among the n first one that have gone to bridge a and b. And so we will decide to send the n plus first to a if u n plus one is less or equal to p n, and we will send it to b 
if on the other hand Pn is less than un plus 1. Very, very simple simulation model where Pn is this quantity here. It's clearly a number between 0 and 1. K is some positive parameter. And nu, the exponent that appears here, is also some positive number. Okay? So very, very, very simple. So it amounts essentially to this. The ends are coming. They've gone. The n plus 4 shows up. You flip a coin on the basis of what you have observed with probability Pn, essentially. You send it to A. With probability 1 minus Pn, you send it to B. Right? What I've written here is, if you wish, the kind of the simulation version of this idea. Oops, what's going on here? Okay. Now, if you simulate, for example, where k is equal to 20 and nu is equal to 2, uh, what you get, I think the, it's not a very, very good picture, but what you see here is essentially what the simulation will give you, and what is below it is what has been observed. And again, it doesn't really matter what the picture is, if it's good or bad. The point made in the article essentially was this, is that with k equal 20, roughly, and nu is equal to 2, you could duplicate the observed behavior in the experiment. Right? Now, remember, De Nobu and his crew, they are, uh, I guess you would call entomologists, right? I mean, they study the ants, they're not interested in figuring out whether or not there is a deeper mathematical reality behind this. All what this showed is that indeed here's a synthetic model that recreates what has been observed. And for me, reading this, which you know, I thought was very, very interesting, surprised me that uh, after looking around for a little while, could not find any justification, mathematical justification, as to why this happened to be the case. In other words, that if I were to look at this as a mathematical problem, which is embedded into this recursion here, could not find any reference as to why I should have, for example, a n over n, which is a fraction of n's that have gone on the A bridge, why that would converge to 1 or 0 as n were to infinity. Okay? Now, this is essentially what got me going. Now, what we have been able to show is essentially this. There are essentially three cases in this model. If nu happens to be between 0 and 1, in a sense, there is no reinforcement, as I will explain in a moment. On the other hand, reinforcement, which means that everybody follows the same bridge, occurs when nu is greater than 1. In the case nu is equal to 1, which essentially represents a phase transition, is akin, and I didn't know that then, but I found that out later, that this was nothing more than Polya's error. Okay. Here are the results. But before I do that, let me. That's right. Okay. Okay. So nu is the exponent that occurs here. Let me make a couple of remarks so that presentation will be simplified later. Fundamentally, this is a two-dimensional recursion. In other words, if I look at the behavior of a n and b n, this is how it, it moves as n goes to n plus 1, right? Because I have a n, I add 1 if u n plus 1 is less or equal to p n, and I had 1 here if u n plus 1 happens to be greater than p n. Okay? Now, you can always take, yes? No, I think it was a synthetic, uh, it was a lab experiment. I think that, uh, I think that if, if I understand correctly, this is what... There was a choice that they were, so they were given a path. Yes. Oh, I see. Yes, yes, yes. In reading this paper, did you find that if they repeated the experiment, sometimes they end up migrating to the top path? Yes, Sometimes yes, yes. To the sure, 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 sure. <coughs> the, point, the point was that, in, in fact, this is what one is, I think, the bottom, the other one is the, the top. But the, the, I think that the, the conclusion was that eventually, like one man, one woman, they follow each other and they're all on the same path. Okay, now here, what this shows is that for, for a while, 
Uh, some go to one path, some go to the other path, but eventually they will all go to on the same path. No, no, but that's exactly what I said, is that sometimes you have variations, there would be fewer. In other words, if they had all followed, it would have been all to, all to one, right. right? But I think that as far as, uh, if, you wanted to, if you want to encapsulate the conclusion, I think that the conclusion was that eventually, as time goes on, they all follow the same path. No, well, I think, it, well, but it shows something close to that, right? I mean, no? Close counts in portions, but not All right, I mean. Uh, I, I think there's a related yeah. question. I mean, if I'm saying correctly, yeah. though, that uh, when you repeat these, uh, so the, the, the time-based uh, graph is there, uh, or it has two possible threads. But when you repeat these experiments, is it the case that in some repetitions, one branch is picked completely. Yes. Yeah. Another repetition, another branch is picked completely. That's so right. if we were now, a follow up to that might be what fraction of the time one branch is picked versus what fraction of the, what fraction of the experiments or repetitions one branch is picked versus another branch. True, but I, I, will, I, will, I will come to that in the, in the mathematical, but I would still argue that even this data here seems to suggest that eventually they all go on the same branch, I mean, you know, I mean... Well, the reason I raise the yeah. question is that this is not so different from a model of giving learning. And if you treat this as a learning result, then if everybody goes 100% go on the path, that says, okay, now the issue is resolved and it's not reopened at all. And I think that's not such a good answer. No, that's right, that's right. And, and that's so right. you would really expect in the real world that you would never get 100% or if you know, in the real world in the system that really worked well, that you wouldn't get 100% choosing one path ever. There would always be some, some continuum, continuum experiment that with the other path. I don't disagree. In fact, if you go to the model here, what you will see, that's exactly what will happen because there's no reason why eventually it should always be the case that Pn is going to be, let's say, greater than Un plus 1, since those are ID random variables, and they could eventually be extremely close to 1, for example, much closer to 1 than Pn will be, for example. Yes. Um, when I looked at the plot versus the data plot, it was also striking that in the mathematical result, the variability was less. No questions about it. Okay, this is just a model, and it's a g I think it, the, the point is that it's a good approximation, and I have to say that once I turned the page on where that plot was, I was fascinated not by the ants, but by the model, right? I mean, that would be my, my answer to this, but I would certainly don't disagree with you that uh, it is possible for some ants to go left while they're supposed to go right, and this probably accounts for some of what you see over there, and that's a good thing because Eventually, uh, who knows, maybe that path is not going to be there forever and it's continuous, continuously explore, right? I mean, that's, which, by the way, this model does not uh, track. Yes? So, so we should probably allow eventually that SN plus 1 equals A infinitely often and SN plus 1 equals B infinitely That's often. right. But the relationship or the ratio is going to be, one is going to be a little O of the other, but otherwise. Sure, sure. Yeah, right. sure. If, so, infinitely often there corresponds to infinitely many repetitions of the experiment? Yes. Uh, uh, no, no, no. Oh, infinitely, infinitely many ants. Infinitely many ants. Yes. 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 One, one experiment, yeah. many yeah. ants. Yeah, right. And I think that should be already clear from what we have here. Okay. So, let me go back to what I was saying earlier. This is fundamentally a two dimensional recursion. Uh, typically, one starts with A1, B1 to be either 1 or 0, 0, 1, but you could take A1 and B1 to be uh, independent, anything you want between 0 and 1 of the driving sequence. And it's easy to see that if this condition is satisfied, then necessarily An plus Bn is always equal to N, which means that although I have a two-dimensional recursion here, fundamentally I really have only a 
one-dimensional recursion because it's enough to keep track of a n since I can recover b n by taking n minus a n. And once I've noticed that, observe that p n, the probability for selecting uh, where the n uh, n goes, uh, or the n plus first n goes, uh, is in fact uh, given by this, where b n has now been replaced by n minus a n. And if I divide top and bottom by n to the nu, then what happens is that I get a n over n, I have a k over n, and this is flushed through this function p nu of two variables, a and c, where a is between 0 and 1, that's going to be the ratio a n over n, and the little c is the k over n that I have there. So what I'm trying to say is that fundamentally this is a one-dimensional problem. The probabilities have this particular form, there is this two-variable function, and I can represent Pn through the ratio An over N. But this parameter here, as we will see, creates a problem because it actually depends on N. The first result that you can show is that if nu is between 0 and 1, then if I look at An over N, it will go to 1 half with probability 1. And similarly, because a n plus b n is n, then b n over n has to go to one half, also with probability one. In fact, going back to I think a point that Prakash makes, it's easy to see that what results from this is a n over n goes to one. All right, it is very very possible that the b bridge is selected infinitely often, but of an order of magnitude less than the other one. Okay, now. Is there an intuitive connection between this new and what's happening to the ends? How much ferromorphism yes, is going to yes, yes. okay. So here's an example where what this says is that if I run the experiment for a very, very, very long time, 50% of the ends will go on one path, the other 50% will go on the other path. So clearly here, there is no reinforcement. This is really akin to each time flipping a coin and with probability one half sending one end to one bridge and with probability one half sending it to the other bridge. Now, here what I've listed is PAC for nu is 0.5, I believe in this case. The thick line here is the uh, P is equal to A and as you increase C, what you see is that this is, you go from the largest C to the smallest C going this way. Notice for future reference that from zero to one half the function, the functions are always concave and they're always above this thick line here. In other words, another way to say this is that for every C, PAC is always greater than A. At least, yeah, yeah, me either. Uh, <laughs> two axes are what okay, so this is A, and this is PAC. And I've uh, drawn PAC for multiple values of C. All right, so uh, C equals zero is this one. C is equal to, I believe, uh, if I can see, point 0.2, and this is point 0.1. Uh, I'm sorry, just the other way around. This is for uh, C equals 0, C, this is C is equal to 0 0.1, and this is for C is uh, 0 0.2, I believe. The number is 0 to 0 0.5? Yeah, b uh, because... Well, this should be really from 0 to 0 0.1. Yeah, this is a 0 0.9. And the sum of the corresponds to C equal to... To P is equal to A, so it's the diagonal. Okay. And the point to be made here is that let's say on the first half, which is from zero to one half, it's always going to be concave, and it's always going to be above this thick line. So the probability is very big. So the, the vertical axis is probability, right? Well, that's right. Greater PAC. than the percentage of ants where that's right. so far that's right. Right. that's right. And I see decreases, that probability decreases as well. In the case where nu is greater than 1, you can prove the following result. If I take, because we don't really know which one of the uh, bridges is going to be selected, 
So we look at the ratio a n over n and b n over n. Those are the various fraction of n's that it will go to a and b. I take the largest, the max, and what I'm claiming is that as n gets to be going to infinity, that max goes to one almost surely, and it happens in a symmetric way. Meaning what? For 50% of the samples, it goes to a, and with 50%, it goes to b. Okay, and so again. What that says, going back to I think the discussion we had uh, here, is that if I run my experiment under these conditions, with probability 1, it is very likely that I will see a sample path that will select one bridge, BE or B. And if I were to do this in parallel universe, 50% of the parallel universe will have A selected, and the other half would be B. Again, what we have here is reinforcement. Because what has happened is that eventually, one of the bridges has been selected. Here, again, I apologize for uh, the picture. It's the same deal as before. This time, nu is equal to 2. Now, observe that the situation is a little bit more complicated here, because uh, let me focus only on the interval zero point uh, from 0 to 0 0.5. What you see is that the functions, instead of being con uh, concave as they were before, they are not convex. Okay, but what you see is that if C is sufficiently large, it will in fact cross the straight line P is equal to, to A. Okay? So the point that was made earlier that the fraction of ants is in fact, in this case, is going to be s uh, larger or smaller depending on the value of C, which I remind you is K over N if you remember what I had put in the, in the previous slide. Okay. Now, if I look back at these results, what we see is that we have first a, a sensitivity to parameters. Okay. First to the choice of nu, because if nu is between 0 and 1 versus nu is greater than 1, in one case we have, we have no reinforcement, in the other case we have reinforcement. And so you can think that there is kind of a phase transition that is occurring at nu is equal to 1. Another thing to notice is that I didn't say anything about K, although in the Dunabu experiment, K was selected to be 20. Very conveniently, why? Because it allowed you to match the data with the simulation. Right. Now, it's not too difficult to see that there are two regimes when K is very, very small versus K is greater than, is a much larger, and one being probably the, the critical point. And what you see is that the larger K the larger a n needs to be in order to make the selection non-random. Why? Because if k goes to infinity, if you look at uh, the probability that I had over here, um, I think, well, let's, yeah, let's do that. Okay, what you see is that by dividing by k to the nu, a n and b n being fixed, this is in fact going to go to one half. So if k is extremely large, in order to have an influence, AN has to also be quite, quite large. In other words, you have to already have made your bed, so to speak, to stay in your bed, right, if K is extremely large. Now, it would be nice to have rates of convergence. That turns out to be, in fact, not too easy to, uh, to do. But I would like to perhaps venture that if I were to look at these two conclusions concerning the choice of nu and the choice of K, that may be a, the reason why all these algorithms are in fact very, very hard to utilize in practical situation. Because here, for example, we have an extremely simple situation. And I don't think that it, uh, it certainly is not written in the paper, but de Nobu, I don't think, thought of looking at the k's nu less than 1. I think he trafficked probably the nu and the k so as to make the data appear, in, or uh, make the, the simulation data appear to match the, the actual observed uh, data. And so if I extrapolate from this simple situation to one, for example, I would be on a network, it's clear that unless I have some mathematical result that tell me exactly what is going on, it'll be very, very difficult to figure out how to choose the parameters, in this case, k and nu. Here, of course, I've assumed that I keep track of an from the beginning to the end. 
right? But clearly, in a in a practical system, this is not you what you would uh, expect. In fact, you, you, we know that probably in most practical systems there is some evaporation, so you don't really keep track of all of the n. And for example, one idea is to say, look, I'm going to have a window of size w, and instead of keeping a n and b n, I'm going to only keep the history between n minus w and n. This is what. And I'm going to use this instead of a n and b n in calculating the probability p n. Now, I don't have any analytical results at this point, but uh, the simulation seems to suggest the following. Is that again, if nu happens to be between 0 and 1, then again, you'd, it's really like a random system. On the other hand, situation is quite a bit more complicated when nu is greater than 1. And what the simulation suggests is that, sure, you have a tendency to select one of the uh, one of the branches, but not necessarily with overwhelming probability. In fact, with a probability which is one minus some function of k and w. And the simulation suggests that here as well there is a phase transition depending on how you choose w in relation to k. Okay. Again, I have very little to say about this because that was really not what I was to talk about today, but simply looking at something a little bit more realistic with finite memory makes the problem already a lot more complicated. You know how I'm sorry, this? Uh, what I can tell you is that... I'm sorry? Well, I would expect it to be monotonic, yes. That I would expect, okay. I'm sorry? Increasing. If W increases, uh, then clearly this uh, A nu KW has to go to uh, one half. Okay, we know that. Okay, because we know from the other result that it has to go to one half. Right. So now, as I started uh, at the beginning, this was a, a very very simple toy problem that. Uh, some of you would argue maybe uh, just intellectual curiosity and perhaps it should be more interesting to look at the case of unequal of bridges of unequal length okay which in this context would basically say look how do the ants figure out what is the shortest path and clearly uh, i think experiments have shown again and again that they do find the shortest path Right? They don't uh, go around the block uh, a few times and then zoom on wherever they're supposed to go. And if you think a little bit about it, you will see that there is a number of obvious challenges for using this uh, paradigm. Because, at least from my perspective, lengths of the bridges should be unknown. And in fact, they should vary over time. Because otherwise, this is not a very interesting problem. And in fact, you could even assume that as uh, the length change over time, that uh, maybe one of them becomes infinite, meaning that that particular bridge has been bombed. It's simply not possible, right? Clearly, if you think about it for a second, since you need to learn about who's, I mean, which bridge is actually the longest, what I've used before, which I would call forward ends, are not enough. Because forward ends basically go where there is, where there, wherever they go, they don't return with any information as to where they've gone and or which bridge they've gone. So you need to have some feedback to learn about the length of the bridge. And clearly this calls for another type of ends, maybe the same that went, but now they happen to be backward ends. Yes? If you have some evaporation, then the time that the ant takes to return, yes. time, that's would be a very good that's right. And so that brings me to the next bullet here, which is that if you're going to consider this problem, which I will not consider in this talk, you ha clearly have to consider the, the, uh, the give and take that exists between the information available and the control that you can implement. In other words, you have to focus on what is the joint information control structure that you're going to be using. Why? Because, look, suppose that you were allowed to periodically probe using, for example, the idea that was uh, just mentioned by uh, Dave Elliott. Well, clearly it would be trivial because you would know which one is the shortest and then you can use what I've discussed earlier to latch on that particular bridge and it's over. Okay? Now, what's more interesting and challenging from my perspective is to have an algorithm based on this paradigm that would be truly adaptive 
but under minimal information structure because the ants clearly they can only act the only way that they can communicate is indirectly through their actions which hopefully will do something to the environment which ants that come later will then learn and will use as a result okay now I will not go any further here but I will move to the second half or the second third rather of the uh, presentation. Any any questions at this point? Yes. For example, right? And again, here uh, I I seem to to play, uh, you know, between design and um, between model ex explicative model and synthesis, right? Because I mean, what Denobuo did is essentially is a model that explains or seems to certainly be compatible with what has been ex explained. If I were to use this paradigm, it could be, for example, in the context of a network, uh, certain uh, elements which are not available out there in the wild may be available. Like, for example, you could do some form of source routing, for example, right? I mean, but w the question, at least from my perspective, the, the interesting and challenging question is how do you manage to make sure that everybody finds eventually the shortest path with at the least amount of information and being in a position where, where this path to change, in other words, where the shortest path become the longest path, somehow the nest, the collectivity, would figure it out and the dispatcher would learn about it. So let's move on to urns. By the way, how much time do I have? Um, I, I, think, I think we can have 15 minutes. How about that? One five? Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right, so it'll be only urns and you won't hear about it. All right, so. I took a certain amount of your yeah, time at yeah, yeah, the beginning, so okay. make it 20. Okay. This is going to be the time that it's for So I'll take 20 minutes from, from there, right? Okay, so I claim that the problem that I talked to you about is in fact a, an instance of what's known as a urn model. Okay. Now, urn models have a very, very long history in applied probability. In fact, you can find already some uh, mention uh, to them uh, in the work of Bernoulli. And if you're interested in this topic, there's a beautiful book by Johnson and Cotts that is kind of summarizes everything I think that has been known. I think 77 is the the original edition, I think there's now a, a, uh, an update uh, that it was published in the 90s. And uh, although I, the model may seem a little silly, it really has uh, application to a very large number of applications. And I've listed them here, for example, in physics, the so-called Ehrenfest model. Um, probabilists probably know uh, about it because of the so-called polya urn model, which uh, is used as a contagion model. Uh, there's the famous uh, Friedman, uh, Bernard Friedman's urn, which describes 
uh, a model of a campaign. And then, uh, more recently, there has been a generalization by the economist Arthur and some Russians, which essentially attempts to show how is it that Betamax uh, won over VHS, right? And uh, this is the kind of model that uh, is in fact being uh, used here. Now there are many generalizations that are available and there are many connections to applied probability. And so here, here is an example of what would be a classical or semi-classical urn model. You have an urn, as you would expect. It contains R red balls and B blue balls. And we're going to modify the content of the urn by uh, recursively sampling the urn. And each time on the basis of what is returned, we're going to add either red balls or blue balls. Okay? Now, if there are Rn red balls and Bn blue balls after the uh, nth draw, then we will select a, a ball uniformly at random. And how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to submit, uh, we're going to uh, select red with probability Rn over Rn plus Bn, and we're going to uh, select blue with the complementary probability of Bn over Rn plus Bn. Now, if the red ball is selected, then we add alpha red ball and beta blue ball. So, basically, you have the arrow as it is indicated there. If the blue ball is selected, then you add gamma red balls and delta blue balls, and that's the rule that you have at the bottom of the, of the slide. Okay? Now you can see that everything is encapsulated in one matrix. The row of R is alpha, beta. It's what's added if you have a red ball that is drawn. And gamma, delta is what is added to the various colors if a blue ball is selected. And we would say that, or we will say that the urn is balanced if in total at each step you add the same number of balls, so the, what does that mean? It means that alpha plus beta is in fact gamma plus delta, and let's call this sigma. And it's not too difficult to see that because of this, if I start with R0 plus B0 balls in the, in the urn, then after the nth draw, I should have Rn plus Bn, which is what I had at time n equals 0 plus sigma, n sigma, since at each step, regardless of how Either I decide red or blue, I would always add alpha plus beta, which is equal to gamma plus delta balls to the, to the mix. Okay? Now here is a urn that has been very, very popular in the literature. It's known as Polya's urn. Uh, it basically says if I select red, then I add one red ball. If I select blue, I select one blue ball. And I, I forgot to say something, but the act of drawing a ball doesn't mean that you take this ball out. It's really kind of more in, the, in one's head, so to speak. You, you look, all right, so you, you decide it's blue or red, and you put it back. Okay. Now, in 1931, Polya uh, proved the following beautiful little theorem that says that if R0 is A and B0 is B, then if I look at Rn over Rn plus Bn, which is the proportion of red balls after the uh, nth draw, well, that ratio, in fact, converged to some P, almost surely. And P is not constant. It's, in fact, random. And it's distributed according to a beta distribution. And that's essentially what I've written at the bottom. Observe that if A is equal to B is equal to 1, so that means you start with one red ball and one blue ball, then as time goes on, you will have mixing, and uniformly, you will find that the ratio is, I mean, that P is uniformly distributed. Now, if you look at this for a second, you can say, all right, good for him. I mean, he proved this. I mean, that was good. But if you are, uh, you know, thinking in terms of uh, law of large numbers and things like that, this is re really a surprising result in a way, because in a sense, and again, I don't like the choice of words, but I could not find another choice. Uh, this depends on the initial condition, and so you can think of this as a non-ergodic behavior, because depending on where you start, you will get, I think, a differently distributed uh, proportion. 
right? Compare this against to, uh, with, for example, what uh, you know best, which is that each time uh, you don't even look in the, in the urn and you flip a coin with probability P, you add a red one with probability one minus P, you add a blue one. What is gonna be Rn over Rn plus Bn? Well, as n gets to uh, go to infinity by the law of large number, this necessarily has to go to P almost surely, yes. Well, you could look at it that way, that's why, but, uh, but in uh, two dimensions, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Okay. right. But you can see that this is surprising because most limiting theorem that one likes to play with are theorems that say that, especially of the, the law of large numbers uh, type, uh, one likes to be able to say that the limit is, is constant. Now, which, again, what this shows is that although this is a very, very simple model, right? remind you what it is. You have an urn, you grab a ball at random, if it's blue you add one more blue, if it's red you add one, one more red, and that's it, and you keep going, right? Very, very, very simple, and yet it has this complexity which is probably not expected at first. And so you, if you start dreaming as to what you could possibly do, well, it's not too difficult to see that an urn model can be described in this manner, as I've written uh, in the middle of the slide. Rn plus 1 is Rn plus what you add in terms of uh, red uh, balls, and Bn plus 1 is Bn plus the number of blue balls that you will, that you will add. And you can ask yourself, well, how do I determine that the, the Cn plus 1R and Cb uh, n plus 1? Very, very simply, you say, well, I'm going to uh, select the, uh, these random variables according to some conditional distribution. And the conditional distribution at first may depend on all the, the contents that you've seen, R0, B0, R1, B1, and so forth, but let's make life easier, let's make it Markovian, so it's only going to depend on Rn and Bn, and let's even be bolder or more simplistic, and let's simply not only depend on Rn and Bn individually, let's make it depend on the ratio, that is the proportion of red balls within the urn after the, the nth draw. Okay? And if you think about it for a second, this is an extremely large collection of models. All the models that I've talked about and many more, in fact, fit into this, into this uh, framework. Now, at this point, you are saying, Mikowski, that's great, but what does this have to do with ants? All right, natural question, which uh, one answers very, very simply. Think of ants as being balls. And think that you are at, that you have, uh, the, the ants have come your way, the first one has been sent on its way, the second one and so forth, and the nth one has been sent on its way. And depending on whether or not it has been sent on bridge A or bridge B, you color it in one case as red ball, in the other case as blue ball. Right? So the ants now have a color, right? And you can think of the bridge selection for the nth uh, ant as really deciding what is the draw for the nth the, the nth draw from, from the urn that you have so constructed. Now, if you change the notation a little bit, what you see is that Bn is equal to Bn. Why? Because Bn going on the br bridge B is the same as the number of blue balls. But An, which was the number of uh, uh, ends that went on the A bridge, is now metamorphosed into the red balls. Okay. Now, yes. Yes. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, since if you make ants equal True. But they are zero. You're absolutely right. I have to be a little careful, but uh, I'm off by at most one. Okay, at most one, right? And it all has to do with the the indices. But you're absolutely right. Okay, right? You. Because you mean the same symbol for the A, R, N, and B. In other words, B n is equal to B n, which is not false. Okay, but B n is the number of uh, blue balls in the urn model. But Bn is also the number of uh, ants that have gone among the first n ants that have gone on the, on the B bridge. Okay. Now, uh, let's see what happens here. Well, if I look at that pair Cn plus 1R and Cn plus 1B, you can see that here it can only take two values. Either it's 1, 0 or 0, 1, because you can only add one ant at the time. 
right? And if you go back to what we had before, well, what you see is that the probability that Cn plus 1 r is 1 and Cn plus 1 b is equal to 0, given the entire path, it's Pn. And similarly, you find that the probability that it's 0 and 1 is in fact 1 minus Pn, where Pn is given by k plus a n to the power nu divided by whatever it's there. Now let me do a little trick here. Let me define, uh, let me divide top and bottom by n to the nu. So what happens, and I've done this trick before, so k becomes k over n, a n becomes a n over n. But now remember that this is a balanced urn. Why? Because I add only one end, either to the A bridge or to the B bridge. So roughly speaking, again, your point will be well taken. A n plus B n may not be exactly n, but if it's not n, believe me, it's uh, n plus maybe 1 or minus 1. Okay, or maybe something else de depending on the initial condition. But the point is that you are dividing by something which is constant, that is, that is non-random. Okay? Having said this, let's look at the following. What we have is the following situation. There are results in the literature, and they are listed at the bottom here, which allow you to say what happens in the limit when Pn is of the form f over An divided by An plus Bn. Remember here we had An plus Bn is n, so it doesn't really depend exactly on An and Bn, right? But, so we have here in fact An over n, and we recover the fraction that we are really interested in. And f is a mapping from 0, 1, that is from a fraction, into 0, 1, a probability, because that's the probability of selecting either A or B. Right? Now, this is known as an urn mapping. And just to make sure that we're on the same page, if you go back and you look at Polya's urn, it's not too difficult to see that f of a is in fact a. Right? Now, the general type of result that you can prove in this setting is the following. Is that if I look at a n over n, this will converge as n goes to infinity almost surely. And where does it converge? It will converge to a set of solutions to the equation f of a is equal to a. All right? And by the way, look at Polya's urn. What do we have? We have f of a is equal to a. So every a between 0 and 1 happens to be a solution. And that explains, in a sense, why Polya's result is whatever it is. In other words, that you don't get in the, in the limit, you don't get a constant. Because every a happens to be a solution of f of a is equal to a. Why? Because f of a is equal to a. Work extra for that beta distribution. Okay. To get the beta, beta distribution. Yes, oh, yeah, yeah. And in fact, it's not, I mean, it's, it's again, it's always the same thing, okay? It's like uh, Ray Richel used to say when the result is uh, true, it's true usually because it's trivially true. And there is, in fact, a very, very simple proof of as to why it is a beta distribution using exchangeability, which is, you know, a beautiful argument that is really half a page. This is really <coughs> magnificent. Someone wanted to raise a... Yeah. So just this is we have multiple fixed costs. That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. It can be countable. It can be infinite. Uncountable or countable. Ah, uh, again, uh, it, could, it could be anything you want. This, I'm giving you only the general form, of the taste of the result. Okay? In other words, that under fairly mild conditions, it all breaks down to studying the solutions of this equation f of a is equal to a. That's really what it boils down to, right? Now, it, this can, of course, have very complicated structure, and it, it's not clear that, in general, you are able to lock the deal, so to speak. So the f itself, the form of f, how can you get all of it in the previous slide? Is there something? Uh, sure, because, uh, OK. But remember, for us, pn ah. is given by this, OK? okay? So, which brings me to the next slide, where I have to put a little tear, because unfortunately, we cannot use these results. Why? Because Pn is, in fact, P nu at An over N, K over N. So, what you, you see is that, sure, it's a function of An over N, but it also depends on N. So, in effect, P of N is F of N at An over N. But notice that when N goes to infinity, if I look at Fn of little a, it actually goes to 
P nu of A zero. Okay? Now, at this point, you're in the back office, it may be late, and you're wondering the following. N is typically going to be large since we're going to go to infinity. So K over N is likely to be so small that it's not going to matter. Right? So is it possible that I should close my eyes and believe that the result that I cannot apply, I can really apply it, but I apply it to the limit that is here. In other words, I will apply it to the limiting function, which is P nu A of zero. And so the natural question that you may want to ask is, well, is it possible that this equation here contains all the information that I need to have in order to conclude? Ah. Patience is a virtue? Huh? No? no? Okay, just a second. All right, so now let's look at what this equation is here. You have P nu A zero is equal to A. So what is this fellow? Well, it's given here. And it doesn't really take much, even without a calculator, to figure out that it has three values when nu is different from one. Right? It's easy to see that the three roots, the three solutions here, are 0, 1, and 1 half. Right? Now remember, a n over n potentially could go to either one of the three. If it goes to either one of zero, we have reinforcement. Because either you've selected A or you never selected A. On the other hand, if A star is equal to one half, then you have no reinforcement because it means that it's essentially operating in a kind of in a random manner. Okay? Now, I will not bore you with the details, but you can take these IDs and you can provide a finer analysis based on the value of nu that will essentially get you to the proof of the two theorem that I mentioned. That's right, because, okay. Now, I think that I'm probably too late, right? Yes, okay, so, all right. So I'm, I'm gonna give two slides and then after that I'm gonna let you go, okay? I mean, uh, not that you're not gonna go by yourself, okay, but, uh, okay, so. The third leg was stochastic approximations. Okay. Now, I solved this problem using stochastic approximations because that's what I, I think about. And why is it that I thought about stochastic approximations? For the following reason. Because, in a sense, what you're trying to prove is something concerning a n over n. That's really what you're really interested in. So let's call that little bugger, let's call it a n. So it's now between 0 and 1. Let's go back to the recursion that we had, the one-dimensional recursion, which was a n plus 1 is a n plus this characteristic function. And because I'm interested in a sub n, let me divide a n plus 1 by, little n, uh, by, a, a n plus, uh, by n plus 1. So what do I get? I get a n plus 1 over n plus 1. That gives me a n plus 1. I get a n divided by n plus 1 plus 1 over n, the characteristic function. But remember, I'm not interested in this object here. I'm interested in this object. So I make it appear by multiplying and dividing, doing some simple arithmetic, and what do I get? I get this. So what do I find? I find that a n plus 1 is generated as follows. It's a n plus 1 over n, and then a term that contains all the subsequent randomness. Now remember what is p n. I have put it here. I believe at one point. Yeah. Pn is P nu of A n over n K over n. So the A n over n is here, it's A sub n. So that's good. Right? So am I going backwards? Yes. Yes. Let's see. Yeah, that's a symphony. Alright. Now the whole point is that this is because of the UN plus one happened to be ID. This is what's known in the business as a Robbins Monroe type approximation. The only catch is that it's non standard due to the fact that the statistics, the conditional statistics here, are in fact dependent on N. So I cannot use the classical results, and this is where. I think a little work is needed, but since it's already late, we're going to stop here. Okay? Thank you. First, let's thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
let's uh, yeah, let's take questions, John. So, so, so uh, the rush it's time for, for the more exit. questions. <laughs> so, what does the ODE look like? Is it uh, the ODE that you will get is this? Ah. All right, and so what you see is uh, this, the plus term is the the p nu of a t zero and the minus a t is what comes from the the uh, stochastic approximation uh -huh. and so you look at that right you can show that that's the the limiting ODE and we know that the stable points for a solution uh, contains the limit points of a n uh -huh. right and here what you see is that if you do, so we know that there are three stationary points, 0, 1, and 1 half. That's right. That's right. So that's easy. What's harder, and that's uh, the really, I think, why it's, I think, more interesting is when nu happens to be greater than 1. Because in that case, all the obvious conditions are, uh, do fail, and you find yourself in a situation where A is 1 half is repulsive, but A01 are attractive. And that's really where you have to do a little bit of work to show that uh, this is basically what statistically will, will, will happen. Okay, so it, it looks kind of silly. The conclusion is easy, but you have to work. Okay. And, and that's. Sure, you can do that. So, thanks, to the speaker, conclusion again. Terrific talk, yeah.